want you to put your hands together and thank him this morning. He has been so, so good to me. It's wonderful as always to stand here and be before you. Uh, welcome to those who are watching online, wherever you may be doing that. Welcome to those of you that are here, first, second, third time. And it's good to see our family members as well, those who are connected and locked in at Life Church. I do want to say thank you to Pastor Stephen for preaching last week. Uh, I know he went home and took a nap after that sermon because uh, that brother preached with all he had. And, and he gave it to you straight from the Word of God. So thank you, brother, for holding the fort down. Um, I appreciate you. Amen. Amen. Uh, real quick as a reminder, we had a church meeting a couple of weeks ago, and the membership covenants, if you've not seen that, sign that. They are out in the foyer. Please grab one of those and sign that and, um, and just leave it there at the, the offering basket. We'll grab that and, and file it away. Um, and just along the lines of membership as well, there is a couple here that I've been meaning to introduce as new members of our family. Uh, and finally, I remembered to do it today. Uh, so <laughs> if the Adams would stand up, Sarah and Brian... Uh, welcome them to Life Church. Amen. Amen. Thank y'all so much. It's a blessing to have them with us. They came and, and visited and dived in quickly, and uh, we're excited about them and their family. And they've got a, a baby and another one on the way. Um, thanks be to God for that. And um, and I've been picking Brian's brain on. Uh, he works with ATVs and stuff. I'm like, man, can I get a discount? Um, I'm working with mine. But, uh, but we're thankful to have y'all as a part of this family. So thankful. Just for a second, I, I want to brag on our life groups for, for just a moment. You know, with life groups, uh, they are a, a huge part of what we do. This is where you really dive in, get connected, build community, build fellowship, all those types of things. And, and, and two of our life groups in particular, our young adults group, that thing began to grow and grow and grow. And Pastor Stephen and I would just sit down and think, man, what do we need to do? How do we need to work with our leaders to make sure we're serving them well? And the best thing to do was to kind of split that group into two. And when you do that kind of stuff, you don't ever know how it's going to go. You know, you don't know if people are going to resist that or go, hey, we really want to just stay together. But they embraced it wholeheartedly, and I'm very thankful for that because them dividing in kind of geographical ter territories allowed them to go even deeper with their groups. And it's just I'm thankful because I'm a part of the group me that they're on. And just seeing the stuff that y'all do in that group, I'm very jealous, by the way. Um, and I know that I can show up, but I don't want to cramp your style because I'm the old guy and I don't want to show up. And, you know, but but it's cool to see. Uh, they're just they're hanging out. They had a friend's giving, uh, you know, this past week and they're doing stuff together. And and it's not just that group, but all of our groups are in community and fellowship together. And I'm just I'm so thankful as a pastor to see that because that was my vision of, of life groups to begin with. And and I'm just I'm thankful to see y'all go deep together and dive into that and and along those lines i just i want you to know this too and i want y'all to hear my heart on this what we do in preaching is very important but that is not the totality of life church what we do in worship is a portion of what we do but that is not the totality of life church the goal of preaching the goal of worship is to focus you on the priorities of god to focus you on the scriptures according to the word of god and to help you stay in line with fellowship, with Christian principles, with what God is saying. That's a portion of it, but that's not the totality of it. And a lot of people can say, you know, well, I'm all about the preaching or all about the worship. And if that's the case, then you really can go find the best preachers online or on podcasts or the best worship, and you could do that at home. But you cannot grow in community and relationship and fellowship at home. You have to do that here in community together. And I'm thankful to see that from the majority of you. And I just want to lovingly press those who are not in community to get into community. This is a portion of what we do, but it's not the totality of what we do. And I want you to lock in to get plugged in. And there's so many ways that you can, can do that. If you've contemplated and thought about, hey, I really like to serve and I don't want to be out front or anything, but I love being behind the scenes. Uh, Miss David, could you raise your hand for me, sister? Hospitality. Go see her today. Today, if you're interested in life groups, say, man, I really love to connect with somebody out of life church. Pastor Steve is in the back. Go see him today. If God has gifted you in, in worship or in media, Pastor William, where are you at? Go see him today. Kids life. We had to have two people that were here for service leave at the greeting time to go help in kids life because we don't have enough volunteers. Go see Aaron today. We need your help. 
But most importantly, it's not just us trying to get something from you. We're trying to give something to you. And when you serve, actively serve, and say, I'm not just here to soak up, but I'm here to serve, it's the way that it's supposed to work. It's the way that it's supposed to work. And when you begin to do that, Life Church won't just feel like church. It will start feeling like home. And we want this to feel like home for you, but there are steps that you have to take that we cannot take for you. And then it'll start feeling like home. Let's pray. Father, what I have not given me, what I see not revealed to me, what I am not make me, and what I know not show me. In Christ's name, amen. Amen. Take your Bibles. Go to the book of Hebrews in the New Testament. Um, By God's grace, we are going through this together, and I have certainly enjoyed this sermon series as we go through God's Word in an expository way. That just means we go line by line, verse by verse, we break it down, we squeeze that lemon and get all we can out of it. And that's what we do this morning. In Hebrews chapter 2, starting in verse 5 through 9, let me read the text for us and give us an idea of where we're headed. It says, For it was not to angels that God subjected the world to come, of which we are speaking. It has been testified somewhere, What is man that you are mindful of him, or the son of man that you care for him? You made him for a little lower than the angels. You have crowned him with glory and honor, putting everything in subjection under his feet. Now in putting everything in subjection to him, he left nothing outside of his control. At present, we do not yet see everything in subjection to him, but we see him who for a little while was made lower than the angels, namely Jesus, crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death, so that by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. Now, to back up just a second, if we look at the beginning of this text here in verse 5, we see that word for. And, um, and it begins that way, for or because. And this means that, that the, the, the writer of Hebrew, we don't know who it was, but the writer of Hebrew, he's giving us a basis for defending what he just said. And Pastor Stephen preached on this last week, and so where we pick up today is a continuation of where we just left off. So when he says for, you do have to backtrack a little bit to understand what the for is, is for. So he's building off of Hebrews chapter 2, verses 1 through 4, and really all of Hebrews. And he's saying here that, that our, our salvation, this is from last week, our salvation is so great and so well attested that it's, it's folly, it is foolishness, it is dangerous to neglect that salvation and drift into indifference. It's dangerous. Why? Well, the text says, For God did not subject to angels the world to come concerning which we are speaking. So how does that make sense then? To say, don't neglect your salvation, and then to say, for God did not subject to angels the world to come. And and what's at stake here is who rules. That's that's what we're talking about here, is who has actual authority? Who is the actual preeminent one? Who is superior here? Is it the angels, or is it Christ? Is it what the angels have done, or is it what Christ has done? And we're building this case from, from lesser to greater. Josh preached on that a few weeks ago. We're we're building this case here from less to greater. And the instruction here is that the scriptures tell us the angels were not given that subjection. The angels were not given that kind of power or authority. And since we've been given this this Jesus here who is co-equal with the Father, he is God. He's also done something for us in purchasing our salvation. And since we have this salvation available, our Role, our position is to not neglect such great a salvation. We don't turn away from it. We don't neglect it. Now, Jesus gave us an example of what neglect looks like. In Luke chapter 14, verse 12 through 24, there's a parable that Jesus gives about this great banquet. And, and in verse 12, he, he, he said also to the man who had invited him, he goes, when you give a dinner, when you give a banquet, don't invite those who have the abilities to come and repay you. Right? Don't, don't go just invite your best friends and those who can come back and say, hey, I got you next time. Jesus is saying, don't invite those kind of people to come to the banquet. Invite those who cannot repay you. Invite the people to come who, who they, they can't give you anything because they don't necessarily have anything to give. Invite those people to the table to sit down and eat. And the Bible says that those who were there, one individual reclines back at the table, and he says, blessed is everyone who will eat bread in the kingdom of God. 
Now, this is a true statement that he makes, but I think this strikes a chord with Jesus because he keeps going with the story. And Jesus said to him, a man once gave a great banquet. And the scriptures describe that he invites a whole bunch of people to come. And at that time, he sends out his servant and says, hey, invite everyone. Come come, Come for everyone who is now ready. And it says that he invites those people, but those folks begin to make excuses that the servant went to and invited. First, this guy says to him, hey, I bought a field and I must go out and see it. Please have me excused. Can't come. And another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen and I go to examine them. Please have me excused. I can't make it either. And another says, I've married a wife and therefore I cannot come. Please excuse me. And I would think that Jesus would say, all right, you're excused. Uh, (laughs) You you got a good excuse, man. I, I get why you can't make it. You get a pass. Verse 21, so the servant, he comes back and he reports to the master, hey, man, I invited all these people and they didn't come. And the Bible says that the master began to be angry. And then he says, okay, well, go out into the streets, go into the lanes of the city, bring in the poor, the crippled, the blind, the lame. And the servant said, sir, what you commanded has been done, and still there is room. And then the master says, hey, keep finding more. Go into the highways and the hedges. Compel people to come to my house and be filled. For I tell you, none of those men who were invited shall taste my banquet. See, they neglected the invitation to come and eat. Now, some might say that, hey, this is proof that you can neglect salvation. And I would say that you should observe the scriptures more closely. The people were invited. See, the the, the banquet host, he had relationship with those whom he invited. Does the text say that he fell out of relationship with them because they didn't come? No. It just says that none of those men who were invited shall taste of my banquet. They were still in relationship, but guess what? They missed an amazing meal. They missed an amazing chance to fellowship with the master of the home. They neglected it. And in Hebrews 2... It's essentially telling us, don't do what they did. Don't don't drift, don't neglect, because drifting leads to neglect. Pastor Stephen explained that. See, I can neglect my walk with Christ. Does that mean that I don't have a walk with Christ? No, it just means that I'm missing out on a really, really great meal with Christ. I'm missing out on some really precious fellowship with the Father. And and in Psalms 34, it says, to oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. And so that's kind of the backdrop for where we get to in verse 5. In verse 5, it says, For it was not to the angels that God subjected the world to come, of which we are speaking. Now, the implications here about angels is that angels do not have dominion over this world or the world to come. God did not tell the angels to be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on earth, like he did Adam and Eve in Genesis 1.28. God did not say that to angels. He said that to us. He said, you have the authority and the responsibility to go and do this. Now, in verse 6 through 8, part A, it's interesting that it starts in verse 6. And it has been testified somewhere. Now, it's almost like the writer is going, hey, I know where this is at, but I'm just sarcastically throwing this out here. I think this was written down somewhere in the Bible. And this is what he says. What is man that you are mindful of him or the son of man that you care for him? You've made him a little lower than the angels. You have crowned him with glory and honor, putting everything in subjection under his feet. Now, when the author writes this and goes, it was written somewhere, he knows exactly where it was written. As do the hearers. They go, Psalms 8, that's where this is coming from. This has already been written in the Old Testament. This is being regurgitated back up. Psalms 8, I'm connecting the dots between what you're saying here in Hebrews and what was said in Psalms 8. But what does Psalms 8 say? Notice this in Psalms 8. The first individual of emphasis is the Lord. Psalms 8. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You set your glory above the heavens. Out of the mouths of babes and infants, you've established strength because of your foes. To still the enemy and the avenger. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, which you have set in place, hang on, because the next individual of emphasis now shifts to man. I'm talking about the Lord. How majestic is your name, all these things you've done, and now it shifts to talking about man in verse 4 of Psalms 8. What is man that you are mindful of him? Same reference in Hebrews 2. 
and the Son of Man that you care for him. Yet you've made him a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honor. You've given him dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet. Notice in the text that the text will now tell us what the all things are. Here it is, verse 7. All sheep and oxen and also the beasts of the field and the birds of the heaven and the fish of the sea, whatever passes along the paths of the sea. And so we see that there is creation that is now subjected to man, which then takes us back to Genesis 128. That we are to have dominion over the fish of the sea, the birds of the heavens, everything that lives and moves. Now look at verse 9 and look at the shift once again of Psalms 8. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. So the chiastic structure of Psalms 8 is God, man, God. Okay? Hold on to that because we're going to come back to that momentarily. God, man, God. God. That's the structure of Psalms 8. Now, I think it's important at this point to really make this connection that Scripture is making for us concerning the humanity and the divinity of Jesus. Because there's this interweaving of God, man, God. Same in Hebrews 2. We're going to see this interweaving of God, man, God. And so it's important for us to do what the Scripture does. It, It connects the cord between God's humanity and God's divinity. The divinity and humanity of Jesus. Same. Now, you can fall errant in your doctrine when you divorce those two from one another. If we just solely say Jesus in human form and leave it over here, or Jesus in his divine form and leave it over here, we can fall into errant doctrine. It's, it's important to also note that uh, the first false teaching about Jesus in the days of the early church, they didn't deny that he was God. But they did deny that he was actually human. They said he only seems to be human, right? The fact that Jesus was walking around, they they basically said that that was a a projected image, that if you actually touch Jesus, your hand would go through Jesus. He's just an, an image of an individual standing before you. He's not actually a man. He's just projected as one. So they denied his humanity. That heresy was called diocesanism, and that comes from this ancient Greek word, which means to seem. He seems like he's human, and that was taught by a guy named Serenthius, and, and he actually opposed John um, in the city of Ephesus. And I actually think that his false teaching was really the premise of 1 John 4, 2 and 1 John 5, 6, if you want to go back and study that. You can also go errant when you only highlight the humanity of Jesus, but you deny his divinity. See, there are blatant apparent religions that outright deny the divinity of Jesus. They say, yep, he was a man, good prophet. Islam is one of those. Judaism is another one of those. Good dude, not God. They denied his divinity. But what about secular cultural Christianity that desperately desires to design a Jesus that gets us? And that Jesus, he's okay with your sin as long as that is sin is consensual, as long as it don't, don't hurt nobody else. That Jesus doesn't require any actual repentance. That Jesus says that, you know, the church is, is relative, and you can find Jesus in a deer stand or in a hayfield, right? You, you, you can find him anywhere else you want. Church is just it's relative. You don't have to come here and gather on Sunday mornings or whenever you gather. You don't have to do the whole life group stuff. Just go wherever you want. You'll find him there. That Jesus identifies with party lines and just so happens to hate all the same things you hate. That's what that Jesus is. But that, my beloved congregation, is a Jesus that we can fashion and hold. That is not the Jesus who fashioned and holds us. The Jesus who fashioned and holds us, he created time and all that is seen and unseen. Therefore, he's got the abilities to stand outside of time, yet step into time right on time. That's what that Jesus can do. And when he stepped into time, he didn't just come saying, hey, what what kind of Jesus can I be for you today? He came saying, I am the heir of all things. I am the creator of the worlds. I am the radiance of God's glory. I am the exact imprint of God's nature. I uphold the universe by the word of my power. I am the purification for your sin. And because the work of the cross is done, I now sit at the right hand of the majesty on high because it is finished. That's the Jesus of the Bible. 
And that holy God, that holy Jesus who came in the form of a baby, his word to us is that if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself first and take up his cross and follow me for whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. That's the word that he brings to us. D. Carson, he says this very well better than I could. He says, it is biblically wrong to think of Jesus as merely God or merely man. It is wrong to think of him as half God and half man or any other percentage split. It is wrong to think of him as man on the outside and God on the inside. The Bible teaches Jesus is fully God and fully man, that a human nature was added to his divine nature. Both natures existed in one person, Jesus Christ. So in verse 6, again, what is man that you're mindful of him or the son of man that you care for him? You made him lower than the angels. You crowned him with glory and honor, putting everything in subjection under his feet. What is man? Let's, let's ponder that question for just a second. What is man that you are mindful of him or the son of man that you care for him? Now, if we take that at face value, Within Psalms 8, within Hebrews 2, there's an aspect of the dynamic to where he's talking about us when he refers to son of man. Historically, canonically, that typically refers to people. What is man that you are mindful of him, that you care for him? Well, what am I that he would be mindful of me? What am I that he would care for me, that he would crown me with glory and set me a little lower than the angels? Who, who are you? Who am I? What is man that the sovereign creator of the universe is even mindful of you? Even has a thought about you and me? What is man? What are we? You know, it goes back to Genesis, and I just, you have to go back to the origins of creation and the fact that God chose to put this thing together and to Give us the breath of life so that we became a living soul. This was God's design, his purpose, his idea. And it's absolutely amazing to see that God would choose to bring us alongside him. Because he was just fine by himself. <laughs> he was God, has always been God, always will be God, did not need us at all. But chose to bring us alongside of him. You know, I was thinking about this the other day. And um, around our house, we got a ton of trees, which means when you blow the leaves, <laughs> five minutes later, it's like you ain't did nothing, right? And so I was blowing leaves, and, um, and I had Spencer come alongside me. I said, hey, buddy, why don't you blow these leaves with me? So I let him start doing it and let him start working alongside me. Now, did I need my seven-year-old's help? No. <laughs> I, I, I did not. Right? Will he make the process longer? Yes, he will. Is he going to make some mistakes and blow the leaves the wrong way that I'm telling him to? Yes, he will. And he did. <laughs> am I going to have to correct his mistakes? Yes, I am. So, Nolan, why would you choose to bring your son alongside of you? I did it because he's my son. He's my son. And I want him to walk alongside me so that he can learn from me. And one day he's going to have his own yard. He's got to blow his own leaves. I want him to learn from me. I, I want to enjoy the company and the relationship that I have with my son. I, I don't need him there, but I want him there. He reflects me. He reflects my glory, so to speak. And I look at him working and I'm overcome with pride, overcome with joy, and the love that I have for my son in that moment. And when he makes a mistake, I am fully capable to fix any mistake that he makes. And it is the same with the Father. He has chosen to bring us alongside him. He has bestowed upon us the honor of working with him working in him and working through him, him working through us. 
within creation, he decided to say, hey, y'all be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it, have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the heavens, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. He chose to bring us alongside to do those things. Now, did God need our help to do that? Absolutely not. But he gave us a job to do, and when we do it, it reflects his glory And it also gives us the ability through God to accomplish what he set us to do. And the highlight of the text here is that God did not do that with angels. He did that with us, with you. What is man that that you're mindful of me, that you crown me with glory and honor? Who, Who am I? Now, let's go back to Psalms 8 for just a second and hold on to what I told you to, to hold on to a second ago. Remember that chiastic structure of Psalms 8? We got God, man, God. Let me show you something that I think is pretty cool in the structure of Hebrews 2. In verse 5, right? For it was not to angels that God subjected the world to come, of which we're speaking. Well, who did God ultimately subject the world to? To Jesus. So we see Christ, so we see God at the onset of Hebrews 2, just like we do Psalms 8. In the next section of Psalms 8, 4 through 7 is man. What is man that you're mindful of him? It's the same in Hebrews 2. What is man that you're mindful of him? God, man, God. Same structures. And then in the final verse of Psalms 8, 9, we finish with God. And in the final verse here of Hebrews 2, 9, we finish with God. Pretty cool to me. Now look at verse 8b. Now, I'm putting everything in subjection to him. He left nothing outside of his control. Again, this goes back to Genesis 128, right? The dominion that he gave us over earth. This goes back to Psalm 8, where he explains creation, right? The sheep, goats, the birds, all that. But then check out verse C, 8C. At present, we do not yet see everything in subjection to him. Now, wait a second. How can things be subjected to man in 8b, but then not subjected in 8c? Is there a contradiction within the Scripture? No. The Scriptures remain as clear as ever. Because while sheep and oxen and beasts of the field and birds of the heaven and fish of the sea can be tamed and subjected to man... There is one thing that cannot be tamed by man. Death. Death. Death has not been subjected to you. Death is not subjected to me. You can tame a bird. You can tame an alligator. You can tame any kind of beast of the field there is. All of that has been subjected to us by the authority that God has granted us. There's one thing that you cannot tame, death. Bodhi Bauckham, he says that the stats on death are pretty impressive. One out of one die. Somebody else said that death turned out to not be dead. Pretty uh, thought-provoking, right? Somebody else said that our life is alone received from death while sleep is the daily interest that we pay on that loan. John Piper, he said it well. He said, it triumphs everywhere. Death does. It strikes babies and teenagers and young adults and midlifers and old people. It scoffs at our medicine and our surgeries and our diets and our vitamins and our exercise program. When all is said and done, rocket scientists die, politicians die, doctors die, professors die, Nobel Peace Prize winners die, the rich die, the poor die, the good die. And the evil die, farmers die, bankers die, carpenters die, computer programmers die, and preachers die. We all die. And while death is undefeated by man, by us, there is one who did defeat death. And verse 9 brings it all home. But we see him who for a little while was made lower than the angels, namely Jesus crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death so that by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. Amazing. We see Jesus. We don't see Psalms 8 fulfilled in ourselves yet, but what we see in Psalms 8 is the fact that it is fulfilled in Jesus. We're still subject to death and all kinds of weakness and fealty. 
futilities. But God has now passed through that weakness. Christ has passed through the weakness and through death, and he is crowned with glory. He's crowned with honor, and he's seated in power at the right hand of God. And all of his enemies are subjected to him as a footstool under his feet. That is chapter 1, verse 13. And as I finish this text this morning, this really does point us towards communion, which we're going to receive this morning. You want to go ahead and open those up. That'd be great. The question is, what is man? What is man? Now, as a result of the common grace of God, the common grace is that grace which God has bestowed upon everybody. You, everybody wakes up and experiences the common grace of God to some extent. Whether you're saved or not, say whether you belong to Jesus or not, there is a common grace that God has extended to all of us that we experience every single day. And as, as a result of that common grace, and asking the question, what is man? Well, man has the abilities to make beautiful music. Man can draw captivating artistry. Man has the ability to design and build structures that can go and touch the sky. Man has the ability to make movies and write books that can make you cry. Man can care for the sick. Man can feed the hungry. Man can be humanitarian and philanthropic. And at the same time, man has the capacity for our switch. Man has the capacity to do the most heinous crimes. Man has the capacity to bring the most dreadful pain. What is man? Well, according to the scriptures of Genesis 126, we are created in the image of God. All of us. What also is man? Man in his own sin is dead without God. That's where we are as well. And because of the authority that God gave us, because of his common grace, anybody can subject creation underneath them. You don't have to be saved to tame a horse. Right? You don't have to be saved to tame any element of creation. God gave us that authority. But you do have to subject yourself under the sovereign hand of God, under his salvific work to claim relationship with this God. And there was something that had to be done that we could not do for our own selves. And so in asking the question, who is man? I think the better question to ask is, well, who is Jesus? Who is Jesus? And Hebrews has laid it out for us of who he is. Go read chapter 1 again. But in essence, to summarize all of that, Jesus is God. And Jesus is also the Savior of you from your sin. That's who Jesus is. And he's a father that walks with us, he talks with us, he calls us his very own. Verse 9, Jesus crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death, so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. Him tasting death for you, personalize it for me, was an act of his good grace. His specific grace towards me, personally. And I'm thankful for it, and this reminds me of it right here. The shed blood of Christ, the broken body of Christ. And in receiving this, we, like, we, 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 we want to give this instruction here that, listen, if you are redeemed through Christ, you are surrendered to him, you have a relationship with him. This is something that you don't run from, you run to. You run to this. We don't run from God in our shame and our guilt. We run towards him because he already sees it, he already knows it. He knows our faults and our trips and our hangups. He knows it all. But if you've not started with surrender, with repentance, you can't fully understand this. If you're not in Christ this morning, my ask of you would be to not receive this today because you don't understand this. Not yet. You can. Don't partake of this yet if you're not surrendered to Jesus, if you don't have a relationship with Christ. But if you do, 
this is freely yours to receive and to remember what he's done. That is the instruction for us. He says, do this in remembrance of me. And that's what we do. And passages like Hebrews chapter 2, it just elevates the truth of what we're doing this morning and why we do what we do. So this represents the, broken, the body of Christ that was broken for you. Take, take and eat. And this cup represents the blood of Jesus that was shed for the remission of our sin. It was shed. It did redeem us. It has saved us. Take it with joy. Lord Jesus, we come before you, God, with a a deep sense of thankfulness, Father. We don't just relegate our thankfulness to a holiday, but to every day. We are very thankful, Lord, that we get to dig into passages like Hebrews 2 and see where the cords are connected from Old Testament to New Testament and sit on this and rest on this. And may they go and eat off of this all week long. There's so much here. Lord, may we leave here with just gratitude, but with marching orders to go God, and to be a light in darkness, if that's with our own families, if that's on the job. God, if that's within a team or a high school or a classroom or a locker room or a court or a field, whatever that looks like, Father, you compel us to go. And when we go, we're not alone, Father. We go with the forces of heaven behind us, but most importantly, the spirit of God within us. And you give us the abilities to live this life. We cannot do this on our own. We don't just pull ourselves up by our own bootstraps. We don't just say, hey, let me just throw it on my back and keep going. No, the way up is down. It's on our knees. It's in humility. It's through prayer. And this church is a way that we can do that together. So thank you for Life Church. Thank you for the gathering of the saints, Lord. I pray that if someone this morning does not know you, they don't have a relationship with you. They have an idea of it, but they don't grasp it, Lord. May you... Awaken them today through conviction, but most importantly, God, through the love that compels us to repentance. So, God, may you do what only you can do. Father, we love you. Thank you for the word this morning. Through Jesus, your son, we pray. Amen. Amen and amen. If you would stand this morning, we're going to continue in worship and uh, just continue to, to praise the Lord for all he's done.